Okay. All right. Well, let's see if we can get this thing rolling again. Um, you guys can all see the screen and look at that. It's actually working. Okay. So off we go and nothing like starting 10, 15 minutes behind. Sorry about that. Lesson number one, the triumphal entry. We are talking about one week that changed the world. Events from Christ's last week on earth. And I believe it will be a real blessing to you guys. And um, I appreciate you guys taking the time to be here and share. So real quickly, I want to just emphasize the importance of the one week, the last week of Christ's life, to know the importance to the authors of the Gospels. It's about one third of the material in the Gospels is actually covering the last week of Christ's life. That may sound like um, new news to some of you, but if you really start looking at it, uh, the last handful of chapters is about a third of the gospel stories take place in the last week of Christ's life and his resurrection and thereafter. So it's very, very important. Also want you to know this is very important to the audience. A lot of the people that were early believers were either Jews or what were called God-fearing people, which had to do with those who were kind of becoming Jews or proselytes to the Jewish faith that came to know Jesus through the Jewish faith that they began with. And so all Jews at that time see, even today, and saw at that time the Passover as the most important holiday. And this particular thing that we came to know as Passion Week or Holy Week or Jesus's final week was also at that time the, the week of the Passover, which was a huge thing in Jerusalem. Jerusalem still to this day swells to about five to six times its normal set, uh, size. And so you're looking at a, um, a city of about a million people that ends up growing to about five or six million people for about a week's worth of time during Passover. And uh, if you didn't know this, this is pretty interesting to me, at the end of every Passover meal, no matter where the Jews are in the world, they will lift a glass, raise a toast, and they say, next year in Jerusalem. And it is their way of saying how important it is to be in Jerusalem and to be in Jerusalem during the Passover. So also just know that everybody who was there when Jesus was doing all the different things that he was doing, like what we're talking about this evening, having to do with the triumphal entry, Jesus entering on the on the foal of a donkey, or some of the things that he's saying when he's cleansing the temple, you've made this a den of robbers. All of this stuff is stuff that they knew from the scriptures. And so it's very important that Jesus wasn't just freelancing and doing whatever he felt like. He was literally fulfilling scriptures and prophecies that not only did he know, but they knew. And so it was him taking on this mantle and saying, yeah, I am the Messiah. I am the fulfillment of things that have been prophesied for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And so this is very, very important to know that at the last week of his life, he's pushing and pressing his detractors and his haters to the very edge where they cannot get away from acting against him. And eventually we know at the end of the week, that final week, Friday, we now know it is Good Friday, but that day, it was a very, very dark day, literally and figuratively, Friday when Jesus was crucified. He left them no choices and options. We'll talk more about it. So here's where we're going to be. Tonight, we're going to start with the sources and the backstory. Then we're going to talk a little bit about your homework. If you did your homework, um, it's always hard for me to get word to you, but you guys are my guys. Uh, Y'all are uh, probably ready to do with your homework. So I'm excited about that. And then we're going to go to the triumphal entry, how Jesus clears the temple, and then our big takeaways and our homework for next week. So let's start with knowing the sources in the backstory. The synoptics and John's gospel. How many of you guys know what the synoptic gospels are? Um, you can tell me by kind of raising your hand and you can just give me the list of what they are or what they what it means to be a synoptic gospel. Anyone? I'll do it. Okay. <clears throat> it's uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke. 
Yes, correct. It is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, not including John. And if you've ever read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you know that they're very similar. But John is very different. But it's very interesting. We're getting the sources not just from one, but from all of the different ones. And um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic gospels. The word synoptic means to see together. So in other words, we're looking at an event in Christ's life, and we're looking at it from one or two or even three different angles at times. Um, John's gospel was something that was very different, different stories, different insights, different characteristics. But the synoptic gospels give us a really unique perspective because it's not just one person's view. It is many person's views. And I just wanted to share this with you so you would kind of get a sense of why do we have, you know, three synoptic gospels sharing some of the same stories. Well, an eyewitness to a hit and run said that uh, the person came from the right, uh, a per pardon me, came from uh, the right and then just continued to go to the left. And so that was true if the person was standing right here in this in this spot, came from the right and then kept going to the left. But another eyewitness said he came from the left and kept going to the right. And that was true because that witness was standing there. And so something as important as Christ's life uh, is not even um, left to just one person's view, but one person who's seeing it from the perspective of, of a Gentile versus one person who's seeing it from a perspective of the Jews. And, and so they have a different perspective, both of them true and both of them in agreement as what God is doing. And it's important to know that he shares those things with us for that reason. Now, let's keep moving on some of these background in issues. The Roman presence or Occupy Jerusalem. Back in that time, the Roman Empire was happening. And let's just be very clear. This is the Mediterranean Sea. And you can see here modern day Spain, modern day France. Here's modern day Italy with its really distinctive boot. Uh, here's modern Greece, modern Egypt. And here is Jerusalem and here is Rome. And you can see that basically all of this area where the Mediterranean Sea would be meeting was ruled by the Rome, uh, the Roman Empire. By the way, um, I can't necessarily recommend this because it's pretty bloody. It's pretty gory. Uh, I didn't want to watch it. I was like a tender little flower. And Shelly said, no, watch this. I love all the blood and guts. And so, you know, I had to say yes. Y'all believe me that it was Shelly's. Uh, anyway, uh, so anyway, this uh, Colosseum on the History Channel was very, very, very interesting. You can go back and watch it. It is pretty bloody, is pretty gory, but some very interesting information like, for example, Rome was a city of about a million people around the time of Christ. Just FYI, and just to put that in perspective, no other city eclipsed that total number of people until London did it in the 1800s. So Rome was like this standalone huge power and, and city, and the might of Rome and all of that stuff was just tremendously different and far and away better than any other. So whenever you talk about the Roman Empire or we talk about it in the scriptures, just know it was quite the place and different than every other city. And also, by the way, the Roman Empire ruled for thousands of years. I, I mean, pardon me, hundreds and hundreds and over a thousand years. Um, and many do not rule for more than 250 or so uh, when they're world empires. And so Rome was the most long lasting empire as well. But let's be very clear. This is Roman territory, but not all of these places were run by Rome with the Caesar being intimately involved. If you notice here, they have this polite wording called client state. And you can see that the legend on the map is saying right here in Judea, where Jerusalem is located, that Israel was basically a client state. In other words, what that meant is they put governors in place and they put tax collectors in place. You guys noticing some of these things, you know, like the Roman governor Pilate, 
who was serving when Jesus was crucified, or the man Matthew, who was a Roman tax collector. So all of these little glimpses, you might know them, but might not put the two and two together whenever you're dealing with it as you go through the scripture. And so you see this, and there was just this uneasy tension where the Jews hated the Romans, and the Romans hated the Jews, but it was easier for them both to just pay the taxes and make it by so there wasn't a huge war that the Jews knew that they would lose, and the Romans didn't really want to keep control over this unruly place anyway. Are you guys all kind of tracking with me today so far? Y'all with me? And so this client state here of Jerusalem is where Jesus shows up as a king. Why is that important? Because Rome does not want any kings in its place. They want their king as the number one. And so there's a tension that exists and goes back and forth. And you can even see it in Matthew chapter 27, verses 11 through about eight, uh, 16 or so. While Jesus stood before the governor, that's the Roman governor, Pilate, the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? You've said so. Jesus replies, when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Notice that chief priests and elders there. The chief priests and elders were the Jews. The governor was the Roman. And who's really in charge here? <clears throat> then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. But it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. And at that time, there was a well-known prisoner whose name was Barabbas. And so when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the, what is that word? It's very important. Messiah, the one who they believed would come and overthrow the government and set up his own, which we know now Jesus was very different, but you see how this is in tension and in conflict and what's going on here. So very quickly, for he knew it was out of self-interest that they, that's the chief priests and elders and uh, rulers of the people, had handed Jesus over to him. So while Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him a message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. And so you see there's a lot of stuff going on when Jesus walks into Jerusalem and rides on the back of a donkey, fulfilling a messianic prophecy. It gets tense real fast with a lot of people with a lot on the line. So real quickly, let's talk about the haters, the people who hated Jesus we know them as the chief priests. We know them as the Pharisees. We know them as the teachers of the law. We know them as the Sadducees. In all of the Gospels, the main opponents to Jesus are known as the teachers of the law, the chief priests, or the Pharisees. They were like a combination of a religious sect mixed with a political party, because back then at that time, it was very hard to separate politics and religion. In America, it's not hard, but in other parts of the world, even to this day, politics is religion and religion is politics. And you guys know that there are states that are still like that, certainly like that in Israel at that time. And very quickly, in all the Gospels, the main opponents are these people. Who were they? They were wealthy. They were elite. They oppressed the ordinary people. Their practices kept God away from the people and the people away from God. And so Jesus wasn't cool with that, as you can quite imagine. And it comes to full display what they're about and what Jesus is about in this passage of scripture that we're about to read when he cleanses the temple or clears the temple, however you want to talk about it, however you want to label it. And I think in some ways, this was the last straw. This was the time where they said, you know what? He's gone too far. He's been messing with us politically. He's been messing with our power, but now he's messing with our pocketbook and we're done with this. We're coming after him and he's not going to do that to us anymore. And I believe that when he cleanses the temple, 
they just decide, you know what, enough is enough. He's mm -hmm. not going to stop. He's going to keep pushing us and making fools out of us. And now it's time for us to get serious about eliminating this threat. So this is kind of the background. It's the sources. It's the backstory. But now it's time for you guys, if you can, to turn in your homework. If you were able to read the passage of scripture that I assigned for Matthew 21, what's your favorite part? What's your favorite verse? What is it saying to you? What's your take away from it? Let's talk a little bit about it. And towards the end, I'm going to give you a chance for a big takeaway if you've got one that you'd like to share. So very good for all of you guys to be here. Even better for all of you guys to just start getting ready to speak up and I'll shut up. How about that? What do you guys have for me tonight? Uh. Now I know I know some of y'all read this. Y'all don't have to be shy. We know one another. We we did the Ruth thing, and I couldn't get you guys to, you know, <laughs> couldn't hold you down. So come on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I you know, is somebody else going. Um, Leroy, go ahead. And I think did I hear Kirthy? Okay, so Leroy, you go ahead, and then I'll grab I'll I'll grab the next person. I thought I had. Maybe I was wrong, but my computer's sick. I will use a new one next time. <laughs> uh, the first five verses uh, were all good to me, but yeah. I just chose one of the uh, prophetic uh, verses that four and five. Yeah. I like, like I said, one through five were all speaking to me, but. Uh, that uh, four and five says, uh, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, saying, tell the daughters of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the fold of a donkey. Yes, yes. Um, this, you know, uh, it spoke uh, in first in Exodus is mentioned it, I guess in the like the 12th chapter of Exodus, it spoke of the uh, Passover lamb. Yes. When Christ is our Passover lamb, so to be sacrificed. Okay. And then in Psalms, it speaks, he, he rides on the clouds. So he could have rode in on a cloud or mm. he could have had cherubs deliver, but he chose to run, come in on the fold of a donkey. And that just showed his humility. You just mentioned the king. So it just spoke of his humility. So that's why it spoke to me. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, that's fantastic. And, and I love what you said. He could have, but instead he, right? Like he could have, right. but instead he. And it's, that's, it's that way all of his life. If you go back and say he could have, but instead he. And how many times he took what we would call the low road, but what he told us was the road to true greatness, right? He who would be first must be last. And the one who would be greatest among you would must be the servant of all. And so he could have, but instead he, and I, I think it's so powerful what you, what you said and how you said it there, all the ways that he could have shown his power. Instead, he flexed his humility and he flexed the identity, not of the powerful and the rich and the and those who had position, but those who were forgotten and oppressed. And that's really powerful reminder of who Jesus was and what he came to be. Um, fantastic, Leroy. Really great. Seriously. Good stuff. Okay. Um, somebody else jumped in there and I'm looking. I couldn't quite see where the, the mute button stopped being so jump in there and share with me again if you don't mind yeah that was me okay all right miss monica go ahead yeah so um two verses jumped out at me the first is verse 11 where it says and the multitude said this is jesus the prophet of nazareth of galilee yeah. so the multitude so um when you read the backstory of um when it was before the the chief priest and the elders and they were asking, um, who do you say you are? When they were asking Jesus, who do you say you are? And 
he didn't say anything. And, um, and the governor said, are you the king of the Jews? And he said, yes, he said so. Yeah. The multitude had already declared him a prophet and they were not, they could not even like um, say, yes, he's the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee, you know? That was one. And um, the second one is verse 12, where Jesus cast out all that sold and bought in the temple. And um, one thing that came to me that fine, it would be very annoying because where people are supposed to go and meet God and pray and all, you know, people have turned it to a place where they do buying and selling, where they do money exchanging and all. And definitely where there's money being exchanged, there'll be thieves in there. And people that usually, that actually need to go there to pray will be scared to go because they might be robbed or something. So that definitely would make him angry and um, mm -hmm. act the way he did. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, what they had done to the temple yeah. was turn it in a totally different direction. And he was angry because of how dramatically different it was from what God actually intended. That's great. Um, really great observation there. And, and then you mentioned also that he came and people knew who he was, that the whole city of Jerusalem said, no, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. So he had made an impact and people knew who he was as he came in. That's great, Monica. Good observations. Good stuff for sure. All right. Time for one or two more. Don't want to belabor, but if you guys have a moment you'd like to share. Anyone? I would like to go I would to say the 13 that. verse. Go ahead, Kirthi. The 13 verse, it says, it is written, he said to them, my house will be called house of prayer. You're making it a den of peace. Uh, specifically, what spoke to me is, he was saying, my house is a house of prayer. It's, we are the house of God. I mean, in the New Testament, circumcised our hearts and hearts for him our hearts can be the home for him but uh, while he was saying you are making it a den of robbers uh, and then in 14 verse he said the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and they were healed but in the contrast who are not healed was this law teachers and the Pharisees and all <laughs> Because they were not humbling themselves. They have other things in their heart. They have idols in their heart. They have keeping, you know, all kinds of pride, jealousy, and all that in their heart. And they were not uh, seeing uh, Jesus as the Messiah. They didn't know it. Blame, blind and lame knew that. They are healed. And uh, uh, he said, making it, uh, a den of robbers means uh, they have been putting all the idols in their heart and when we come to the uh, last verse that is 21 and 22 he will say but uh, also you can say to this mountain go throw yourself into the city and it will be done if you believe you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer I think here God is saying the mountain which he is referring is that pride and jealousy and other things which are displeasing to the God. They have to humble themselves and pray such a prayer for their hearts to be cleansed. Once if they do it, they will be healed and their prayers will be answered. But these law teachers, they will make all ritual prayers which will not be answered. Mm. Yeah, that is powerful. And sometimes the biggest mountain that we have is exactly what you said, our own pride. And that's the thing that prevents us from really knowing God and seeing God work in our lives. Um, and yeah, for sure. Uh, they were full of pride and empty of God, which is a sad situation to be in. But they had the title. They just didn't have the, the relationship. Great, great observations, you guys. As always, y'all are amazing. If you guys would like to share a big takeaway at the end, you're going to have that chance. But for right now, I'm going to turn it over to my uh, my scribe and Pharisee, uh, Miss uh, Teresa Guest, going to read these scriptures for me. So y'all don't have to listen to my voice any more than you've got to. Let's talk about the triumphal entry that happened on the very first Palm Sunday. 
Teresa, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you read a few scriptures for us. And, uh, and then we'll pick up, uh, I'll do the talking after that. How's that? All right. All right. Here we go. All right. Good to go, Miss Teresa. Thank you. Okay. Matthew 21, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Beth page on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Um, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. <clears throat> the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. All right. Thank you so much, Teresa. I just want to point something out to you guys. Did y'all notice here that I made notes? I pulled these footnotes up and I wrote them here so you would remember where these came from. The reason I point this out, I don't want to take for granted that sometimes you see these little footnotes, but you just keep reading. And I would just encourage you, probably about 80% of the time, you will come away with something when you read the footnote that will help you to understand a little bit more. For example, if you just simply read it, you don't realize maybe that it's a scripture reference, but it's very clearly a scripture reference. And then here, one of the footnotes is Hosanna, which is an expression of worship that means save. It's like asking for God to save us from ourselves and from our sins and in our situations. And so whenever they're shouting Hosanna to the son of David, they're saying, you know, save us, son of David. We need help and we need the leadership and the, the power that you bring, not what we bring. Um, and then also you will see here that uh, Psalm chapter 118 is also listed as well. And so it's just important for us to know that this stuff is something that can kind of illuminate the scriptures just a little bit for us. Because of my computer problems, let's keep moving here um, pretty quickly, but I don't want to go too far. Did you guys have something that jumped out to you? Did anybody have something really uh important that kind of jumped out in this particular passage that we just read anyone well i would say that this is day one this is the first day of the week this is palm sunday as we come to know it but it is the beginning of Jesus announcing himself to the people in Jerusalem who've been looking for the Messiah to come. And whenever he fulfills what is spoken of in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, that thing that Leroy mentioned, it was a fulfillment of the scriptures and the prophecies. When he did that, I again want to remind you, he knew what he was doing. The people who watched him knew what he was doing, and the people that were haters of Jesus also knew exactly what he was doing, and he was declaring himself to be the one that they were looking for, even though they didn't want him to be the one they were looking for in the case of those who hated him, and so it's important he's pushing them, and you will see all throughout this entire week Jesus is pushing them and pushing them and pushing them further and further and further into a accept me or reject me, but no more middle ground for you. 
No more waiting. This will be something that ends by the end of the week. And this is important. I don't know if you guys went a little further and read the entirety of the chapter. Maybe you did. Maybe you didn't. But the haters asked him. They said, we have a question for you. Exactly who gives you the authority to do all of these things that you're doing? Jesus says, oh, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. I've got a question for you as well. And I tell you what, I will answer your question of me if you will answer my question for you. And they're like, okay, let's play this little game. And Jesus says, those things that John did and the things that he said, all of the things that you know about John the Baptist, was he from man or was he from God? Hmm. And uh, and they were like, uh, let us talk about it for a second. They huddle together. They realize they've rejected John, but everybody in, in the area thinks that John was a true prophet. And so they're like, um, it's hard to say. We can't really tell. And Jesus says, well, it's hard for me to say, so I can't really tell either. Now, that doesn't really sound like a friendly person trying to find middle ground, does it? No, Jesus was pushing them all week long to accept him or reject him fully. He was giving them no more middle ground. And you'll see it all throughout our time together as we look through what, what is going on in this week. But just know this wasn't something that Jesus was surprised about. <gasps> what? You're going to you're going to crucify me? This is shocking. No, he knew it and he was pushing them towards it the entire week. He wasn't there to make friends. He tried and he had reached to them. He talked to them as straight as you could, and they still had not changed their ways. So just know he was no longer in the shadows or on the sidelines. He was declaring himself and he was doing it, looking them straight in the eye the entire time. All right. Questions, thoughts, or comments? Anybody? That was good. Huh? All right. Well, let's keep going then. Let's talk about when Jesus clears the temple. Was it once or was it twice? If you don't know, there is a passage of scripture in John chapter 2 that is connected to Jesus at the very beginning of his ministry, the very first miracle. You guys remember what the first miracle of Jesus was? Yes. What's that? Water into wine. Water into wine. Water into wine. Water into wine. You guys got it. That's right. So Jesus turns the water into wine. And not long after that, near a Passover, probably about three years earlier than this final week, Jesus goes into the temple and he sees the very thing that he sees in this passage of scripture that was in Matthew chapter 21. Now, you can believe that Jesus never cleansed the temple or that he cleansed it once or that he cleansed it twice, twice, because the Bible does have it at the beginning of his of his ministry in John, and then he has it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels. They all list it at the end of his ministry. So real quickly, let's just talk about that. I personally believe that Jesus cleansed the temple twice, and here's why I believe that. Not only does it show up in a time where I believe John was speaking about some things in chronological order. I know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke reference this at the end of his time uh, here on earth in this final week. I believe it was two times, and here's part of why I believe it as well. Think about this for a second. I don't think that Jesus came in, turned over the tables of this thing that was putting money in their pockets like you would not believe. And they said, uh-oh, we got a guy who we've never heard of that's upset. You know what? We'll just stop doing this. He's right. We're just going to stop. Does that sound like the Pharisees to you at all? <laughs> no, not at all. They were obstinate. They were stiff-necked. They were rebellious. And Jesus came in and showed them in the mirror exactly who they were and how God felt about it. But they didn't change their tune and they didn't change their action. He did that all throughout his ministry and they didn't change their tune or their actions, except for in very small pockets. Man here, man there, a man named Nicodemus here, you know, a man named Joseph of Arimathea there. They were Pharisees and they followed him, but they were the exception by far and not the rule. 
And when Jesus came in in John chapter two and turned over the tables and they said, why, why are you doing this? And who gives you this authority? What miraculous sign can you tell us? Jesus answered him differently. Then he said, you know what? Here's going to be my sign for you. Destroy this temple. And I'm going to build it again in three days. And they're like, no way. There's no way you could do that because it took us decades and decades to build this temple. And then John says, but the temple that he spoke about was the temple of his body, right? And so we know that there's a different conversation going on than the one that we know he had in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where he would not answer their question. And so I believe that there's a cleansing twice, once at the beginning of his ministry and once at the end of his ministry. Now, let me ask you a question. Does this have a lesson for us? If he had to do it twice, does this have a lesson for us? Oh, yeah. I, I learned I learned a lesson from it. What do you guys learn from that? Hmm. Yeah, huh? he's trying to tell us something. He's trying to tell us something. Can you hear me, Pastor? I can. Yes, sir. Oh, wow. <laughs> I put it on my phone instead. I'm sorry. Didn't you want me to? <laughs> well, yeah, I guess now. <laughs> Uh, well, we're going to get into it in a little bit, I guess, but, uh, uh, well, let's just go ahead. I'll stop. I'll stop. We'll wait to the end. I'll save it for the end. Okay. Yeah. No, no, that's good. That'll be your big takeaway, right? Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so what do you guys see? Uh, he cleanses it once and then he cleanses it at the, at, at the end of his ministry. Once at the beginning, once at the end, is it telling you anything? Does it tell us something? Is there a lesson for us? Okay, I'll tell you something else. Can okay. I? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, it reminded me of what they do today. These people, you know, the, you go on TV and you see these evangelists. I mean, not only the evangelists, but they're uh, name it and claim it blabbing and grab it they're creating their own uh picture of what god stands for and he's uh they're doing that in the temple and it's similar to what's going on today if we if we uh care to believe it mm. uh oh shots fired i think is what the kids would say uh <laughs> no you're not that guy <laughs> That's good. No, no, I'm definitely not that guy because I do believe that there are a lot of people. It's been done all throughout the years and all throughout the ages that use godliness as a way to get gain. As Paul says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And he says, and there have been people that have traded their faith for their finances. And there's nothing in the world wrong with a pastor being supported or a true minister being supported. I believe that. I believe the Bible teaches that. Um, but I also know that, you know, Randy Puckett doesn't need a private jet to be, you know, <laughs> useful in this ministry that God's called him to, right? I mean, that's, there's a difference there. Um, the ministry that you've been called to is one to minister to people, not to get financially well off. And so it's important to grasp that. And they didn't. They used it as a way to gain power and to gain financial uh, success. And we're going to see that a little long, a little more. And I would just say also, too, this to me is, again, uh, an example of Jesus not being willing to let them keep going, pushing people away from God. And that's what people who are sacrificing integrity for finances in Christian ministry are still doing to this day. They're pushing people away from God. And there are a lot of people that will not give the gospel an accurate, an accurate hearing and an open mind because they don't believe that the people who are God's leaders are doing it for the right reasons. And that's important. Like that should be something I take very, very, very seriously. So Amen. anyway, that's me. That's Amen. me. All right. Well, let's talk about four ways that the chief priests and the Pharisees exploited people in the temple. Some of this is going to be a rerun for some of you, but it's always good to go back. So in that day, 
they had Roman money that they used because they were in the provinces of Rome, right? The client state of Rome. So they would use Roman money. And just like our coins, if I had a coin, it would have a, a, an image of the president. It would have an image of Julius Caesar. Well, in the days of Jesus and even many Jewish coins, they don't have graven images on them because thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And so they'd have a weight of the coin, but they would not have an image of that coin on that coin. And so they would have to exchange their dirty secular money for sacred money. And the way that they would do that is they, they'd say, oh yeah, well, we'll give you um, an exchange rate that gives us 10 times the amount of money that we should be able to earn, but we're doing it here on the Roman Tem or on the uh, uh, Jerusalem temple. So the exchange rate, they got socked, you know, because of that. And then they would deny good animals that they had brought for Passover sacrifices automatically. They'd be like, nope, that one's not going to pass inspection. The priest is not going to let that animal be your sacrifice. So you've brought that animal all the way up to Jerusalem from wherever you're from for no reason and no good purpose. Even if it was exactly what God had asked them for, the chief priests and Pharisees said, nope, we're not going to accept it. And why? Because instead of your filthy animal that will not pass inspection, we just so happen to offer our own animals raised here on the Temple Mount right over here that you can purchase since you don't have a sacrifice anymore now that yours has been rejected. Are you guys following me? And guess who raised those animals? We did. Guess who gets paid for those animals? We will, right? And most of those animals were not anywhere close to the same level and quality as the ones that people were bringing for the provinces, but were automatically rejected. You see how nasty this business is getting? And then, again, they were overpriced, and they were blind, lame, and diseased. And I'll go you even one better. The whole point of them raising an animal was for them to all year long say, don't touch that animal. That animal belongs to God. He's the best animal in our flock. We're raising him like a pet and we will go and give him to God because he's the best animal we've got. And so you could tell your kids, don't touch that animal. You don't do those things because that's the one we're gonna sacrifice when Passover comes. You guys follow me? And so all year long, they would have their attention and their kids' attention focused on God at important times and a reminder that we give God our very best, period. And instead, these priests who were supposed to be pointing people to God said, don't even worry about raising an animal, keeping it, talking to your kids about it all year long. All you got to do is just show up by one of our animals that's pre-approved and you'll be, you'll get passed in that way. I mean, it is stepping right in front of people and God. And if you look even a little closer, I'll go you a whole nother one. He says that they were talking about selling pigeons or doves. Depends on your translation. They're kind of the same animal, the same type. That was, by the way, the cheapest sacrifice that you could get. And that was the one that was set aside for the poorest people who couldn't afford an animal like a sheep or a lamb or an animal like a cow or a bull. And so you had a tiered system of upper class, middle class, and lower class. And who are they selling the two, these overpriced things to? The lowest class of the people that could come and couldn't afford any of it. And they were taking advantage of it. It's pretty bit, it's pretty bizarre, pretty bad business all the way around. Just a mess, if that makes sense. All right. Well, so let's talk about Jesus clearing the temple. And I'm going to turn it back over to uh to Teresa to read. If you don't mind, Teresa, go ahead and pick up here. Thank you. Okay. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, 
but you are making it a den of robbers. <clears throat> the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You Lord have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out to the city to Bethany where he spent the night. All right. Hopefully you guys saw some of those things talking about the chief priests and the teachers of the law, the doves, the changers of the money. Maybe that makes a little bit more sense when you're thinking about those ways that they were exploiting people. Maybe it makes a little bit more sense. And real quickly, <clears throat> I am still going to try to close uh, as uh, a little earlier, a um, little shorter on time. But you know, with the problems that I had at the beginning. Thank you all again for your patience. Let's pick up and let's talk about Jesus cursing a fig tree and what that's all about. So let's read that passage. Miss Teresa, I'll turn it over to you and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Okay. Early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immedi immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what, the, what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. All right. So very quickly, I asked this question, and let's talk a little bit about it. Jesus, what did that fig tree ever do to you? Why, why did you curse that fig tree? What's that all about? All right. So we're going to talk about what that's about. And Jesus did have a reason. So real quickly, when you see this image right here of the Statue of Liberty, probably within the first two or three things that you think, you think that's a symbol of America. Is that true? Can I see your, yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. Yeah. So if you see this picture right here, what do you think? That is a symbol also of America, right? Right. right. What about this right here? The <laughs> Uncle Sam, I want you. What is that? That is also another symbol of America. Yeah. So it's different symbols, but they all kind of have the same meaning, right? I'm not indoctrinating any of you guys to, you know, join the military, America or whatever, but here's what I am saying. What did this tree, this fig tree do to Jesus? Well, you probably didn't know this, but the fig tree was one of the symbols of the nation of Israel. Just like these are images in your mind that speak of America, the fig tree was an image in their mind that spoke about Israel. And God's patience with unfruitful Israel is ending. He's had enough. The parable of the talents, I'm going to go away. And when I come back and I see that you were unfruitful, you will be cast out into outer darkness. Or the parable of the tenants, I will send my son to those and they will collect the money that they owe me. And then they said, no, this is the son. This is the heir. We'll kill him and we'll seize on this and we'll take it for ourselves. You see these parables and this fig tree? It's God's way. It's Jesus's way of saying, I'm at the end of patience with the way that you have treated my people and the way that you have treated your God. It's enough. And this is very interesting. Something about fig trees that you may or may not know, but the figs actually come out on a fig tree and then the leaves come out. Most of the time you get leaves and then fruit. With a fig tree, you get fruit and then leaves. So when Jesus from a long distance sees that there are leaves on there, 
he goes over there with the expectation that there should be fruit, but there is not. Are you guys seeing the symbolism here? Yes, sir. Leaves made that tree appear to be alive, but no fruit on it showed the actual truth. And Jesus cursed it because it said, I'm tired of you looking like you're alive when you're actually dead. Do you see what he's trying to say to Israel? You've been called God's people for all of these years, and yet you have no use for God. You have no respect for God. You have no desire to do what God has asked you to do or even commissioned you to do as a chief priest or a leader in God's, God's house or even his, his nation. By the way, before you get too upset, he was the God who made that fig tree live in the first place. So he could do with it what he wants to do. Um, he was proving a point and it was a dramatic point. Israel, no fruit means a curse coming down from God on you. And it will happen very, very quickly. So that's what's going on. The fig tree that fig tree didn't do anything to Jesus, but the fig tree of his people had turned their back on him and he'd had enough. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. I don't know if you guys knew all this. Is this, is this brand new information to you guys? Uh, hand, hand up. Is that, is that new information? Did you guys, okay. Some of y'all knew, some of you didn't, um, but hopefully that will help you. Um, powerful lesson. All right. Let's bring this to a close. Um Next week, I promise, uh, I can almost promise and guarantee we won't have uh, issues with the computer. So let's bring this to a quick close. Homework and the big takeaways. Your homework assignment is to read John 13. I think you're going to love that passage of scripture. There's a ton in there. There's some really powerful lessons and some great observations that you can make. Read John 13 and come ready to share some things. I think it's going to be a huge blessing. Um, come ready to share your favorite passage, what, uh, what spoke to you, what a big takeaway you have or whatever. All right. Do any of you guys have time for one or two here? Do you have a big takeaway from the triumphal entry, the Palm Sunday, the clear, the clearing or the cleansing of the temple or the, uh, the curse on the fig tree? Is there a big takeaway that you personally have as you leave this lesson? Anyone? Yeah, I do. Okay. Uh, the, the people knew of Old Testament scripture and they recognized when he came in that town and when into uh, Jerusalem on that donkey, when yes. they started laying, taking off their own clothes and branches and whatever, throwing it on the ground. That yes. to me stuck. It's somebody knowing their word, you know, knowing the word of God. It is, it is interesting, isn't it? That they knew yeah. the word of God and they recognized the powerful thing that was going on in that moment. Knowing the word of God brings brings a benefit in so many ways. That's good. Anyone else? Another big takeaway that you have? Anyone? Well, I think Kirthi articulated a great takeaway earlier with regard to faith. It's kind of like this all kind of lines up to say that unless you have faith like a child, you cannot be saved. You know, this is what Jesus wants and desires for his people is to have faith like infants and nursing babies. And so, and then he talks about faith to move mountains and um, but the Pharisees weren't healed because they didn't have faith. So it all kind of lines up good or lines up, you know, together to with that common theme. So I thought that was real cool that she pointed that out. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's always good to hear from you guys. Y'all have great perspectives, great observations, and great knowledge of the scriptures. And I always want to say, what is your big takeaway? I label this next slide as the big takeaway. Um, it's not the big takeaway. It's really my big takeaway. <laughs> and uh, you can use it if you'd like for your own. But your takeaways are important because that's what God is speaking to you through his word. And that's important. I ask not because I don't have one, but because yours is important. And you can always ask yourself anytime, read a scripture and say, what is my big takeaway here? So 
get ready, keep doing that. And God bless you guys. Great observations. Here's what I came away with. Jesus came to fulfill what God had foretold through his prophets about the coming Messiah. Unfortunately, God had also predicted uh, in Isaiah and other places that the leaders and rulers of his people would not be faithful to him, but they would choose gain over godliness. Something that you mentioned earlier, Leroy. But God sent his son to pursue the common people and meet all of us commoners where we are. And we no longer needed a mediator. We no longer needed a chief priest. We no longer needed a high priest because he was going to become our high priest. And so any need that we have, we don't have to go and find a person of integrity because we already know the ultimate integrity is our savior, Jesus Christ, who we call on and come to God through. And so we call to him and we say, God, please help us work with us, bless us, forgive us. And we ask it all in Jesus name. Amen. Right. Why do we pray it in Jesus name? Because he is the high priest who comes to God on our behalf and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And so even when we see people who have God's name labeled on them that choose gain over godliness, we know that's them, that's human, not God, right? And so we can say they also will pay the price, but ultimately it does not change the truth. The truth lies in God and God alone. He is our high priest, and we don't need anyone else to point the way. He always does. So that's my big takeaway. That's what I walk away from. Hopefully, that's a blessing to you and uh, something that you can use. Listen, guys, thank y'all so much for joining. God bless y'all. I hope y'all will be here again next week. I've been loving our time because there's more and more of you in it, and uh, we appreciate it. So be ready. Be ready to come share and uh, be ready to come learn as we continue in this season of Lent to draw closer together and closer to God, okay? All right. God bless you guys. Love y'all. Y'all be careful out there. God bless you. Have a great rest of the week, and I'll see you on Sunday, if not before, okay? All right. Y'all take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.